All right, good morning everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody. This is our City Council work session for Monday, April 3rd, 2023. And it is our last work session over here in the community room. We're gonna be looking forward to getting back into our council chambers in two weeks. We have a couple of items today. The first item is kind of a fun historical event and we have our public safety complex time capsule ceremony. And this is, uh, actually we have, it shows Deputy Chief Tim Hall, but we have Chief Hall here. Yeah, t Tim was called in sick today. He wasn't able to make it in, so I'll, uh, I'll take this over. It's, it's very informal. So uh, <laughs> we have uh, an example here of what the time capsule will be. Uh, and we're asking um, council members and um, our department members and any of our city management team staff if they'd like to write letters uh, or include a picture. Um, we were talking this morning, perhaps get a picture of our council members or city management team and a department picture in the, in the capsule. Uh, we had plans to seal it up today, but unfortunately we couldn't get a hold of the mason. And so we're still working on that. But. Uh, I want to turn it over to you, Mr. Mayor, or any of our council members, if you'd like to say anything. Once again, very informal, but uh, maybe I'll just start. Thank you. Um, Deputy Chief Cox reached out to me. I wrote a letter to put in there that we got in there. Um, if any other council members would like to do a little personal letter to put in the time capsule, I kind of encourage that. I think it's a great opportunity for us to give a slice of what we're doing now and kind of let a future generations know that we're not just alive and well, but we're actually thriving post pandemic. Are you Sorry sure? <laughs> well, see, I got, I got the chime of truth. <laughs> what better affirmation do we need? It's Somebody from another planet showing up. <laughs> Any other members of council would like to make a comment about the time capsule? Right. Excellent. Chief, back uh, to you. Just, uh, when's the deadline to have it done yesterday? <clears throat> you know, I think we could at least extend it out another two weeks oh, for okay. sure. And so, if you want, to, if you want to write a letter and uh, send it over to um, to Tim Cox, and then we'll make sure we we get it in there for sure. And what I did was I wrote my letter and then I sent it over to Lisa so that Lisa could put it on city letterhead and put it in a city envelope so it just looks a little, a little nicer. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I like the idea of putting a, a picture of our staff in as well because I think you guys do so much for the city and I like to be able to recognize that. And I want the future generations to be able to look back and go, oh, hey, there's grandma. <laughs> Yeah, I do think it's an opportunity. I mean, I know it's the police department, but I think it's a good opportunity that, you know, as a city, as a whole, and that's something I put in my letter, if we have pictures or we have something that any of our staff members want to put in there, I think it's great. We should do it. Outstanding. Recognizing the fact that it was, building this building wasn't a solo sport. It was a team effort, a lot of different team members. So, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right, moving on to our next item is our municipal court annual report. And this is retiring <laughs> Judge Greenacre and our new <coughs> city judge, Aaron Maxwell. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Judge Maxwell and I are pleased to present our 2022 uh, annual report uh, to you. Um, I wanted to, I thought I would begin by going over some of the highlights of what we accomplished in 2022 and then turn it over to Judge Maxwell so that she can talk about uh, the future of the court. Uh, I'm not gonna read all of our uh, accomplishments of 2022, but I do want to uh, highlight just a few. Uh, during 2022, we appointed Bo Nerland as the alternate municipal court judge. As you can recall in the charter, there is the uh, uh, discussion of an assistant municipal court judge who is appointed by the municipal court judge, but 
serves at the pleasure of the council. Um, the alternate judge is something that's provided for in the uh, ordinances. And we structured this uh, in conjunction with HR differently so that uh, Judge Nerlin is a city employee. Uh, he works on an hourly basis. He is uh, uh, evaluated by the municipal court judge and the municipal court judge uh, also manages his time. Uh, he serves on an as needed basis. Um, so I think this is going to be a, uh, bring some clarity to this position and puts it more into the employee structure uh, of the city. And that's been working out uh, well so far. The purpose of this position is to fill in when the municipal judge is not available uh, for whatever reason. Secondly, under office procedures, if you'll recall, uh, last year, or a year before actually in 2021, we had some issues with the liability accounts. Uh, some of those were out of balance. Um, some of them hadn't been dispersed for a number of years. Uh, and I was especially concerned about those that related to money that should have gone to victims. Uh, I'm pleased to report that we are now, have all of those accounts in balance. And Karina's working very hard on a regular basis to monitor those accounts to make sure that the funds that are received, uh, especially in, for victims, are in fact paid to those victims. And that counts uh, been uh, zeroed out, if you will. Everything that's come in has been paid out. The Comprehensive Operations Manual. When uh, the issues arose in 2021, we had a five-page uh, typewritten form that had some of the procedures. But there were, was no comprehensive manual that described uh, how the office was run, especially in terms of the full court system. And operating the full court system is the key uh, to the court being able to uh, complete its core functions. Uh, this was a high priority. Karina agreed because she had nothing to work with. So she has now uh, prepared uh, a comprehensive manual. When I say comprehensive, we just added some new uh, software, so it's going to have to be updated for those purposes. It's going to have to be updated on an annual, on, on a regular basis as procedures change. Um, but this manual is uh, actually very impressive. What she has done, uh, and I have to rely upon her expertise to do this, is that she has taken screenshots of various full court pages and various other forms that we used and circled them and highlighted them and given written instructions on how to perform each function. So, uh, and as a matter of fact, we've had, uh, an, we have to cover the jails on the weekends now uh, because of the 48 hour rule of having uh, uh, cases monitored. And uh, we're using this manual as a way of a training device for uh, the judges that are having to do that and other personnel that are having to do that. So I think it's, it's a great addition to our uh, uh, operations. Um, finally, I wanted to tell you, uh, bring you up to date on the court appointed counsel issue. Uh, by statute, we are required to have uh, independent indigent defense counsel. And if you recall, there is an ordinance provision that says if we don't provide indigent defense counsel, we can't impose a jail sentence. So having enough counsel to uh, represent indigent defendants is important to the operation of the municipal court. There are two ways that we can do this. First of all, we can hire a uh, attorney that's already on contracts with ADC, the Alder Defense Council, Office of Alder Defense Council, which is a statewide organization, because those attorneys have been vetted and they're monitored, and if they don't perform properly, then they're removed from the list, uh, and they're also required to undertake certain uh, CLE requirements relevant to criminal cases. Um, the other way that we can do this is if we find a private counsel who's not ADC uh, certified, we can have them certified by the ADC Municipal Court Division. And we are now signed up in that program. You have to sign up annually. We're signed up for this year. Uh, and we have filed, it's kind of an interesting thing. You have to submit your request 
in, by September of, I'll call year one. They tell you by May of year two if you're admitted, because I think that's when the legislature meets and gives them their budget. So you're eligible for year three. So it's like a year and a half process uh, to, be, to become eligible. We are now certified in that program. And uh, if we need to find private counsel who are not ADC qualified, then we can refer them to uh, the municipal court program and they will certify them for us. Um, so that's a big step forward. Last year, we got down to one alternate defense counsel in the 7th Judicial District. And I tried to recruit others uh, and ran into difficulty. So in conjunction with these uh, steps, we also increased the hourly rate to $125 per hour, which was more than the ADC rate. Uh, our one lawyer was very happy to accept that, and he signed the contract immediately. I was able to recruit another lawyer from Grand Junction um, to fill that role for us, and she signed the contract uh, and is on board. Judge Maxwell, and in her private practice has run into another lawyer who's just come to Montrose, an ADC certified lawyer, and we signed him up last week. So we now have three lawyers, uh, and if, you know, things change, of course, in the legal profession. Uh, if uh, they happen to move on, we have a basis for finding other counsel. So I think that we uh, have uh, made some great strides in that respect. Now, one thing I wanted to point out to you on the statistics is on the first uh, first page of the statistics. It shows that our filings for 2022, 2021, and 2020. As you can see, in 2022, we had 984 case filings. In 2021, we had 1,309. And in 2020, we had 1,194. So obviously, our 2022 filings are down. Uh, I, I don't have an explanation for that. Uh, you know, we probably will have to do some research but what, one thing I did was it went into full court and I did an analysis of case filings from January 1 to April 3rd, 2023, 2022, and 2021, and also 2020. Um, and what that discloses is that for this year, we have 212 case filings through this date. The same date last year, we had 137. And for the same date in 2021, we had 248. So it appears that our caseload is trending back up um, to where it was. And of course, we can't solicit cases, so we have to take whatever, whatever is filed. A couple of other observations in that respect uh, about our uh, cases. We are getting more requests for court trials. And, and I don't know why, um, but it seems like more and more people are requesting court trials and we've had to add a Thursday afternoon uh, to do court trials to accommodate that case. Though, because we have only 91 days to try the case from a not guilty plea. And secondly, we have been getting some more requests for court appointed counsel. So uh, those are some changes in the way we've done business. At this point, I will turn it over to Judge Maxwell. I want to say that uh, she and I have worked together for about a month. I think she's doing a wonderful job, and I think she will be a wonderful municipal court judge. I have one, one oh, question. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, do you think that perhaps maybe the reason why uh, the cases are trending up is that perhaps maybe now we have more staff in the police department? That might be uh, part of the, the trend, the reason for the trend going up? You, you know, without doing the research and maybe speaking with the chief about it, I would not like to guess as to why the they just go up and down. Oh, okay. we, we do know they go up and down, but uh, I can't say why. Thank you. And good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Um, and <coughs> Judge Greenacre's being quite modest about all the accomplishments that the court has um, made in the last couple of years. Um, and as he said, we've been working side by side for the last month, which has been really great. Um, he and his staff have, have been working hard to get me up to speed. Um, but it is because of those accomplishments the last couple of years that I think we can, we can reach and meet some of these goals that we've set out for 2023. Um, and 
there's a couple of them that I do want to mention. They're, they're listed here. There will be many things that come up along the way where we take on a challenge or, or realize that there's an issue and need to solve the problem. But one of the things I think we need to do is um, educate the public and communicate with the public about what the union support does. I think for most people in Montrose, they really don't understand what the role is um, or ways that we can kind of um, help or connect with people. And so we're hoping to expand that both in person and online. Um, I think the, the website could be a little more user friendly and anymore people go to the internet for their information. So um, I'm hoping that we can expand on that um, and make it a little more accessible for folks. Um, another goal that I have um, is to connect offenders with the community resources. Um, that are here. The mental health and, and drug treatment issues um, are, I mean, it's, it's just a part of the criminal justice system. But um, a lot of people don't know what resources are available. And I've been fortunate enough to um, be in roles leading up to this one that um, have, have educated me as to what services are out there. Um, I think we can connect the people that need mental health treatment and need substance abuse treatment to um, some of these counseling services that are out there that they just don't know how to make that happen. Um, I think that we're in a pretty cool position actually to be able to help people before the problems spiral, before they're so bad that they end up in county court or district court. Um, and so I think it's kind of a unique opportunity that I'm, I'm hoping we get to um, work on here. And finally, the other thing that I'm really excited about is expanding the teen court program. It is a it is a really awesome setup that teaches, um, it teaches the youth about accountability because someone is in trouble and they're being held accountable and they're, they're learning that there are consequences to their actions. But it's also giving the, um, the youth and their peers a chance to understand how the justice system works because you've got people playing the role of the prosecutor, the role of the defense attorney. Um, and seeing that in action, I think, um, piques their interest and, bless you, um, in, in that system moving forward and in educating them to talk about it. So um, those are some of my goals. Like I said, a lot of it I'm learning is is kind of taking on the challenges as they walk through the door, and you don't know what it's going to be until you know that that morning or that person does walk through the door. But um, I'm very excited to become a part of this team, um, and I I'm excited to see what the future will bring. So thank you. Please come see us anytime if you want to see it in action as well. Cool. Thank you. We we are really excited to have you on board. <laughs> We're really sorry to lose you, but we understand the, the appeal of a trout stream and a grandchild. <laughs> we get it, we get it. Um, again? Just don't use them for bait. <laughs> <laughs> or for bears, either one. Uh, if you guys need anything, you know, of course, that we are always available and always on your side. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Any other members? Any questions? Uh, I, I just like to come in on your goals. I, I think they're uh, wonderful. I, I, I think that uh, sometimes the people in the community are kept in contact. And uh, I guess I, uh, I understand the part about uh, the internet or the uh, not being user friendly. I'm not a techie, so. I'm always pushing the wrong buttons and <laughs> having to start everything I do all over again. Uh, thank heaven we have us an excellent uh, IT person here, and I wish you all the luck in the world. And thank, thank you so much. much. I'm sorry. I've got a quick question. All right. So I love the information you guys provided to us. It's used, it's really good to see that you know how much useful public service and what percentage of what for your total case filings they fall under. The last one, which is juvenile age versus substance, it, it, it lists alcohol, cannabis, and vape. But isn't vape really just the delivery method? Is that last one really like nicotine? I mean, is that? No, you can actually uh, you, uh, consume cannabis through a vape pen. 
Okay. And so, and which one would you file that under, since cannabis and well, vape are separate? The way we do that, this is an internal statistic. We do that based on what the charge is. Okay. So if they're charged with a vape device, we call it vape. Okay. If they're charged with possession of alcohol or possession of marijuana, then we put it in those categories. Okay. So it's more the charge than the substance. Right. right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank Council for your support over these last two years. I know we've talked about a number of issues uh, that are important to the court and the city of Montrose, and I really appreciate your support in addressing those issues. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. Okay, moving on to item B on our agenda is the 2023 Pavement Marking Contract Award recommendation. And this is Street Superintendent McPretty. Actually, I'll be presenting this one today, Mr. Mayor. All right, and <laughs> we'll, we're happy to see you as always. This morning. But uh, it's a busy morning, you may have to step out, so I'll jump in and present this one. Um, so this is for our pavement marking contract for, for this year. Um, typically see this every year, um, at least a renewal. In this case, it's a uh, new contract with Stripe Lot, which is who we've been using over the last many years, or as long as I can uh, remember. Um, and this is for long, long, long line striping, uh, arrows, turn lanes, parking lots, um, crosswalks, things like that, all, all parts of pavement marking. Um, some of these are preformed uh, thermal plastic, some are a high grade epoxy, and some are just regular marking paint. And it's dependent on location um, and use. So roundabouts are an example of a, an area we use the preformed thermal plastic, um, where some of our long, long lines that are not immediately adjacent to a road, those would be a regular um, marking paint. This material is one that's been highly volatile over the last few years. We've seen some um, large increases and even on this contract uh, force majeure in the last couple years. Um, and we have well-documented price increases from the supplier. So in this case, PPG is the, the main material supplier to Stripe Lot. And um, we have good documents from them as far as increases they're expecting for the year. Um, and are comparing that obviously to the increases we're seeing from Stripe Lot. Um, we're also able to compare to um, other municipalities and um, what they're seeing as far as pricing for, for striping. Um, and actually the rates we're getting from Stripe Lot are significantly less than what we see in other areas. Um, part of that I think is because we're lucky enough to have Stripe Lot here in Montrose. Uh, they do work all over the state and all over the region, um, but they're from here, so um, we kind of get to take advantage of having a local um, provider. So um, this contract is a not to exceed for $200,000, which is what we budgeted this year. Um, that will, the increase in rate was actually more than we anticipated. So we did it, um, we increased our budget by 15%, incre you know, anticipating 15% increase. Uh, it was actually about a 20% increase. So we will adjust our scope for Stripe Lot to fit the budget. We will not exceed 200 grand, but it will actually reduce some of the amount of striping we'll be able to do this year. Um, which will be okay. We'll um, take care of our you know priority areas, and and we'll plan to um, make up for that next year uh, by increasing our budget um, to accommodate that. Um, so with that, I'll have answer any questions you may have. Um, <coughs> One of the things I've noticed is that, and I think it's important for our citizens to note that we see a lot of these price increases on everything from lawnmowers to paint, and that there's not a lot we can do about it, other than roll with the punches. Try to anticipate it. That's yeah, and I know and I want to give you and your staff also a big kudo and thank you because you have done a really great job of rolling with the punches. <laughs> we just wish they would just stop punching us. <laughs> yes. I have a question. It seems like when we do see these rate increases, sometimes the recommendation from staff is to increase the budget, and sometimes the recommendation is to do less work. And I would assume that's based on, for example, in this particular case, it seems like you're not worried about doing less striping and that we'll get caught up next year. I would hate to get behind <coughs> in a way. If you were worried about us getting behind and not having capacity to make it up, you would perhaps recommend going over the budget. So you're balancing yeah. those things when you make those recommendations? Yeah, and in this case, we're able to use different materials to, uh, where we may use an epoxy um, on a year where we had enough budget to do all of it, we may use a regular marking paint. 
um, to be able to get it covered with the budget we have available. So we have that in this contract, we have that um, availability where we can change the material type and be able to cover what we would need to anyway. Where in others, if it's a single item um, mm -hmm. where we, we don't have that option to sure. change, that may be the difference. Where in this case, um, we feel comfortable doing this amount of work and it's not getting behind for next year. Okay, because if you felt differently, you, you would we request would. an increase we would. in the yeah. budget, okay. So we're not shorting our <coughs> citizens Correct. on yeah, products we'll still being delivered. Everything we had, um, there may be a parking lot that doesn't get striped, or something like that. that okay. um, you know, the lower priorities that aren't going to necessarily present a hazard or, or anything like that. But we'll definitely be able to accomplish all of our our major striping and crosswalks and things like that we had planned anyway. Okay. Because at the same time, the prices are going up. Since we're primarily, our revenue is based on sales tax, we are also seeing increased revenue. So I just want to make sure we're not not doing stuff that really needs to get done. No, okay. I, I believe we'll be fine with the budget we have this year. Um, I do anticipate a substantial increase next year. Um, okay. One, again, material prices increasing, but also what we're lacking this year. Okay. Thank you. Jim, what, what are kind of life cycles on your stripe? So we do it every year. Um, it depends on the material we use. And that's where we're, we're really strategic about where we use what type. Um, the preformed thermoplastic is um, supposed to last around four years. And that's where we weigh the balance of, it is obviously much more expensive, um, but on Main Street, for example, would we use that or would we use a regular marking paint and have to do it every year? And so, um, some lines, um, we think of like a, where's a bike lane, um, the line that's closest to the traffic, uh, we will use an epoxy paint, which is more expensive, but it gets more traffic on it, snow plows, things like that. And the outer line, we use the regular marking paint because it sees less traffic. And so we, we watch a lot of those things. We try to make changes each year that make sense. Um, but we, we definitely do striping every year and the lower grade of paints get replaced every year. Um, thermoplastics, typically four years. And Main Street is one that we'll be doing this year. The thermoplastic was done four years ago and it's definitely needing replaced and that'll be one we'll focus on this year. I'm assuming that the, show, the snow and the salt and the sand don't help you out anymore. That's right. And the condition of the asphalt too. That is part of it that, um, you know, the um, streets that have had some kind of improvement and with our new asphalt or even a uh, surface treatment, the markings last a lot longer on those where the asphalt that is much more you know, abrasive and porous, um, it doesn't stick as well and it, it comes off a lot easier. So um, it's also based on road condition. Thank you. What we're doing, we have our Move Mo project coming forward. We have a lot of work going to be done on our streets. Is this striping part of those projects or is the striping of those independent of this? Um, so they, we do striping as part of Move Mo. Yeah, so awesome. what we'll do is a lot of times when we're doing a like overlay, it's a chance to add a bike lane. We've got a clean slate. So we'll go through, survey, and realign all the strike things over the years. Sometimes you'll see blocks are kinked to each other and stuff. So we always take it as a chance to redesign all the striping, um, lay it out. Uh, so our department will do all that layout, and then we just call them. And that's another beauty of them being in town is, you know, when they're stop by in between two other jobs, they'll hurry up and just, you know, hit that street and then charge us according to these rates. Yeah. Usually those are going to the capital project billing side of things, um, but you still work done under this country. Yeah. So those are built into those capital projects and yeah. those resurfacing projects independent of this contract. So we're actually doing more, more yeah. than people might understand. Yep. And we are careful to make sure they're aware of the street improvements that are coming, so we don't stretch the street before it's replaced. So, so I don't know if you were going there or not, but yes, we do. I was going. Uh, yes. <laughs> I was going. Don't spend that money extra. painting the street. And then we're not going to paint the street and then repave it. Exactly. Perfect. Any other questions? Perfection. Well, let's move on to the next item. And now we're on item C, our collateral substitution ordinance. And this is Finance Director Shaney Wittenberg and City Attorney Ben Morris. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and City Council. I guess I'll, I'll kick this off, but there are definitely several people around the table that can answer questions if they come up. And I think we even have someone online, correct? Ben? That is Ashley Dennis. Ashley Dennis. Yes. With Kutak Rock, Tom Peltz's office. So just a little history. I don't know um, how much everybody knows about this. I know there's some. Um, newer people in the room. So 
1998, we actually bonded to do some street improvements around Montrose, which included San Juan Avenue and Grand Rio Grande, um, amongst others. So when we paid that off in 2017, that afforded us the ability to borrow more money without increasing the budget. So we opted to borrow $10 million, and the decision was to do it as a certificate of participation, which means we lease our buildings to the bank, and the bank leases them back to us. So I know Barbara is very well aware of this. This is kind of how the financing for the Red District happened. Um, so when we did that, we actually um, used Historic City Hall as the collateral for part of that loan. Um, now that we've got other things happening in the community, um, opportunities to do some things differently than we thought of in 2017, uh, we need to relinquish Historic City Hall and substitute it with other collateral. Um, we have proposed the Animal Shelter and the Brown Center as that collateral exchange. So in your packet today is Ordinance 2620, and it has um, basically gives the um, authority for signatures on several documents, and Ben can get into those documents if needed, um, to make that collateral substitution. And then the last piece is that we will hear this on first reading tomorrow night due to the, the time frame. We really need to move um, quicker on this than we would otherwise. So with that, um, can you entertain any questions or comments? Uh, Hi there. Yeah. I have a list of questions here, so sure. uh, uh, be patient with me. Uh, on, well, I, I, I'm just kind of, uh, uh, okay, first of all, what's, what's the value of the property that's listed that we're moving from the city hall uh, to valued at. Do we have an idea what that is? It's approximately two point nine million dollars. Well that that I'm t I'm asking about the 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 Brown Hall and the animal shelter. Does that adequately meet do we have a value there that adequately meets it? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh. It actually does. Okay. And then uh, I noticed that on the old agreement there was a, a an adjustable arm rate or whatever on that and I believe it's going up to from a 1.9 something to uh, something else it did it actually adjusted in October of 2022 from 1.913 I think to 3.93% Okay, and that goes into effect on April 1, right? Uh, we actually made the first payment at that increased rate in October of 2020. Oh, in, in October. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did, have we paid on, on that when we made our payment? Have we made any principal payment on that? Or is because if I'm not mistaken, it says something in there about making a principal payment on the due date for the next one. Have, have we paid anything to lower the principal down? The way this debt was structured is that we pay off the pavilion first. So principal payments on Historic City Hall would have happened in 2030, I believe, um, or something like that. Okay, so, so we, we won't be paying it off till 2037, so we'll be making correct. interest payments till then and every five years. Correct. Uh, it'll be added on to that. Uh, I have another question uh, relating to the sublease. Okay, we have a sublease currently with uh, uh, Tuxedo Corn and also with, uh, uh, and they have a sublease with the Lighthouse uh, that was recently extended for five years. Will we be able to still continue that or will that change? Uh, it is my understanding that those are those are not an issue with this collateral substitution. Okay, I'm seeing her shaking her head. Is that yes it's an issue or yes it's not an issue? We can't hear you one moment. We're, we're having technical issues here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
that technical issue is with it so tremendous. Can you try again? Can we go ahead, go ahead and speak for us? See if can we... you hear me now? Yes. yes. There we go. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to note that this is a very timely question. We received the lease last week and have reviewed it. There are no federal tax issues with that lease. Um, the lease is permissible within the terms of the, the current structure that we have. We've also forwarded the lease on to Zions and it's currently under review by their legal team. Because the Brown Center was only included in the property um, as a matter of convenience because it was located on the parcel, it was not included because it was necessary for any credit reasons or for, um, you know, to get the property to a value that was acceptable to Zions. We do not believe that this is gonna be an issue. Um, I say, I, I have to use the word believe because it's still currently under their, their legal review, but we've expressed to them that we, it doesn't cause us any concern as bond Council. Um, what may happen is the clients might ask for um, some additional representations and in, in some of the closing certificates. We might have them sign a consent uh, just so that it's in line with the terms of the lease. The lease currently requires the consent of the lender if there's going to be a sublease. Um, so we might just include a different or additional closing certificates in connection with the lease that was discovered. Um, but I don't believe that it's going to pose a problem. That being said, we are working with Lions currently, and as soon as we have the final green light from them, we'll let the team know. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be an issue, particularly because the Brown Center was not initially anticipated to be included in the substituted property. Thank you. Okay, with. <laughs> Uh, uh, with that, uh, the transfer uh, of the building, uh, there's a rate increase for the next five years. What is that? Uh, per the original documents, it goes up, well, it could go up every five years. It went up to 3.93% back in October. And what does that mean in payment? Do you have a. It took it up about 30%. Okay, so. But this would have happened independent of us doing this transfer in any way. So that, that it would have happened whether we did this transfer or not. It, it, and it happens happened. every five years. Yeah. I, I just uh, was trying to stay ahead of, of, of what, uh, what we owe. Uh, I was just uh, uh, kind of concerned if, uh, about the, the 2.9 million dollars and we're uh, the debt on that to make sure that uh, the other property qualified uh, based on the fact that uh, we're going to be uh, selling that for a uh, million five and that's about half of half price so uh, Anything else, Ed? Uh, I just, I, let me finish reading here. I just wanted to see if I had left out anything that I uh, wanted to ask. Uh, one more time, explain to me about the paying off the debt on that building. Uh, I, I didn't quite catch it all about, we have to pay the pavilion first. Uh, it's structured to pay the principal on the pavilion first, uh, and then the historic center. Okay, because uh, I thought that, that it also stated someplace I read that uh, uh, we could pay on the principal on these uh, due dates when, like, for example, like uh, this this month was the five-year anniversary that we could play, pay on the principal, uh, uh, but... Uh, uh, we didn't have to if we don't need to. Maybe that. That would be a partial, um, you're talking about partial, partial prepayment of the loan. Right. Um, so if we wanted to pay a portion of the principal, we would have to do that in conjunction with the um, interest rate change. Mm -hmm. So we would have had to take advantage of that in October of 2022. Oh, okay. And our next opportunity is October of 2027. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. That's, that's all I have. Any other questions for staff on that? Uh... We don't anticipate applying for any GOCO grants on these properties, right? Because I did learn on the rec center, 
you can't apply for a GOCO grant if you oh, have right. used the property as collateral for a COP. So I'm thinking about the Brown, a Brown Center and I'm thinking about the animal shelter and I would see no reason we would be applying for a GOCO grant at either of those locations, right? I wouldn't think so. Okay. That's a good thing to remember though, just in case. Yeah, I, I, I think I remember reading that someplace. For example, I would, I think this would be a bigger concern if we were looking at, say, the amphitheater. Um, that would be a big concern, or, or our park system or something. So I'm glad to see mm -hmm. that that won't be a problem. Yeah, anything that were adjacent to GOCO, uh, <laughs> yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Well, thank you, appreciate that. Let's move on to the next item. Our item D, the South Third Plaza Construction Contract Award and right-of-way vacation. And this is Scott Murphy, Jace Hockwalt, and Ben Morris. Tag team. Steve. Um, got a spot here for Steve. So uh, thank you, Council. Um, we've got Steve Matheny joining us here, uh, director of the Montrose Campus for CMU. Uh, we've been great partners on this. And then uh, Marty Guy is here as well, and David Shield with Belmont, uh, both uh, partners on the construction and design side. Uh, so the South Third Plaza, I'll scroll down here just to get everybody oriented. So um, just to orient everybody, this is uh, Montrose Library. Uh, it was back in 2017, I believe. Uh, we vacated a portion of the Cascade um, uh, right of way, and CMU constructed a plaza when they acquired the um, Brands 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 Center. Brands Center. Uh, so you know, kind of an extension of the campus there. Uh, so that was you know in place already. Uh, this year or last year, we were looking to repave. You know, it's so then you know since then, CMU has acquired Cascade Hall. Um, that's where Forum is if, uh, to help people get familiar with the area. Uh, you know, kind of to support the increased use in this area, we were looking to improved sidewalks as you can see there's you know kind of more or less non-existent here and paving um, curb better sidewalk along uh, the cascade hall frontage as part of move last year you know as that kind of came together um, and talking to cmu they are renovating cascade hall working are working on a renovation of that and they, you know the campus programs with the police academy and all the um, trades stuff nursing schools all kind of continue to expand um, we saw a great opportunity for some synergy here um, and I think one of the ideas might have even started with council member of, well, why not just go all out and close the close South Third and continue the pedestrian plaza here? Um, we started to look into it, um, and that's where um, the kind of product went from there into this uh, more or less extension of the existing plaza um, between where it stops now near the library sign uh, and CMU sign um, down to Cascade Hall. Um, when we started looking at that concept, you know, one of the biggest concerns was parking. Um, if you look in this old area, you'll see that CMU had a, a building here, and they acquired the building that had a kind of an out our accessory structure that was kind of a shop building. They were able to lease. Um, we looked at you know the parking needs in this area. We didn't want to lose any parking, so they agreed to relocate that. Um, it has since been removed, and that would convert all of this area into parking lots. Um, so between those two, we're able to kind of keep the, obviously the pedestrian connectivity here, get all of this improved, and end up with a net increase of eight parking spaces. Um, so these would all be open as, as public parking. And then there's two businesses that remain here. Um, one just turned over to, it used to be uh, Carleen Callahan. It is now a uh, uh, dental surgeon, I believe he is, mm -hmm. um, going into this building. And then this is an accounting office. They will both remain, um, and their parking will remain unchanged. Um, so the original project uh, was, you know, we kind of went for the full dream initially, uh, kind of like we do is, you know, price it and see where it lands and then adjust from there. Um, so the original project had, there's a picture showing some of the more decorative features. So lighted seat walls, which are pretty similar to the, some of the ones you see on the PD here. Uh, uh, combo uh, table and chairs setups, uh, similar to what we have over on Centennial Plaza, uh, you know, increased lighting along uh, throughout the plaza along North Third in the parking lot to match kind of CMU's campus standard. Um, then a lot of landscaping in the uh, intermediate areas. Um, we have a flagpole here, which was part of the, they use it for their flagpole ceremonies as part of the police academy. Um, 
And so that was the original project. Uh, this kind of gives you a feel for some of the kind of landscaping and campus themes um, that the project has. Um, we bid the project. Uh, we had one bidder, uh, Skip Houston Construction. Um, the unit rates were reasonable, uh, especially, you know, the parts that were most elevated were landscaping and electrical, which those trades are extreme, of all the trades, those are the most, ex most busy, and so you s their pricing reflects that. Um, our original bid came in at 1.103 million, um, which is obviously over the budget. The budget for this project was 700,000, so the city was contributing 500, which was what we were gonna use for this area for our paving improvements and street improvements um, uh, that we carried over from move mode the year prior. Um, I think there was a little bit of addition, but uh, CMU was then contributing the other 200,000. Um, of that 1.1 million, it was about 50-50 plaza um, and streets. Um, and so then we kind of went to the drop back to the drawing board of CMU to see what could be done to get the product back within budget. Um, with that, uh, the kind of modified plan is for construction of all the main elements. Um, really looking to take out a lot of the um, secondary lighting, uh, seat walls, and uh, landscaping because those can all be added later. Um, so what we're looking to do is construct all of this concrete plaza area. Um, the areas that are shaded green here, which would have been plantings, would be crusher fines for now. Um, with the project, we'll do all of the parking lot lighting because it's the only area that doesn't have lighting right now. Or it, the lighting that's there is in conflict with the parking lot. We have to get adjusted anyway. Um, so we're looking to stub and run power. Um, you know, for those new lights, we'll set the new lights, build the parking lot, build all the streets because that's what our you know 500,000 was budgeted for anyway. Um, run power stubs, run water stubs, run stubs underneath all of these, uh, all the concrete areas so that um, at some point we can add landscaping in the future, you can add lights in the future and you're not having to dig anything up, you're really just adding into those vacant areas. Um, there's existing lighting along the north side of South Third, those red banner arm poles. Um, we were going to replace those because they were getting kind of close to the end of their um, useful life, um, but they can be maintained and, and br brought back into service. Um, and uh, so we don't have to replace those. So those, the lighting elements were, were crazily expensive. <laughs> um, it was kind of funny when you go through, um, it's almost like it was meant to be. We went through and you know just worked top down with the contractor. And you know, thanks to Skip Peace and Construction, uh, you know, it's hard to go to a contractor and say, oh, by the way, we want the product to be a lot smaller. Can you, do you still want to do it and, and bother and, and take the time? But they were very graceful about it, took the time. We ran through every single line and saw where we could cut. Um, scrolled down and magically there we are, you know, you know $400 under budget. So, <laughs> um, so we were able to get it back. Um, and initially we had cut, you know, trash receptacles, benches, bike racks, all of those things. Um, we, you know, went through the exercise, saw that it was affordable. We brought some of those back in. So it will have trash receptacles, benches, and the bike racks initially. And then we are able to keep the flagpole. Um, we'll just have to put it on a solar light kit instead of uh, hardwired, which is not a big deal for the, for the flag lighting um, so that they can have that for the, for the police again. Um, so with that, you know, we got the, the construction contract down to 659, add in 40, that brings us to 699 and some change. Um, so again, right below the $700,000 budget. Um, the work is scheduled to kind of kick off as soon as possible. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but we do have some old, um, we have an uh, aged asbestos, water asbestos cement water line out there that is currently being replaced, or has been replaced by city crews in anticipation of this project. So they'll be out of the way by the time this contractor mobilizes. Um, and you know we'll keep access to the businesses throughout construction, but the goal is to uh, be done and ready for fall semester. Um, I think with that, turn it over to Steve. Yeah. I just appreciate the partnership with the city and extending this Civic Plaza. Um, the fact that this long-term vision is consistent with what both the college wants to accomplish and the city in providing that Civic Plaza um, is really a great opportunity. So we really appreciate the partnership. The one thing I might add to that is that this is not just uh, cosmetic, that since we have a lot of our classes and our uh, activities are in Cascade Hall, we have a lot of students crossing that area every day, and that it also rises to the level of a safety issue of providing that safe conduct across that area without having people getting hit by cars, which would kind of make your college experience a little less exciting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a natural progression. 
um, as the campus expands. You know, without the trees and stuff in there, we will put up extra signage too to make sure that no one accidentally drives over the deposit because if you blend that up, that'll be nice and level initially. So um, we'll make sure that that's very visible. With the parking and the bringing in um, power for lights and stuff, it seems like it might be a great opportunity to apply for a Charge Ahead Colorado grant through the Colorado Energy Office for electric vehicle charging. But I know but I also know this project is moving along quite quickly, but could could you look at that and see if there's a way to in, incorporate that? Because it seems like it really aligns really well. Yeah, we can look at, um, yeah, kind of strategic conduit placement. Yeah, and, good, and getting money models. and getting money to do it. And then, um, and then yeah, if we want to pursue like EV parking there. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, the rate this is going, you know, kind of two things here. The circuit we're running for the lights will run off of Cascade Hall. If we were to do an EV station, it'd be on its own. Right. Here. Um, so, but we can look at where the power drops are and make sure that if you know pick the logical location for that parking and make sure we can run if that's something we do have a little bit of, we reduce the community down to five percent but um, that would be enough to cover something like that if we needed to um, so we can certainly look at that yeah I think it's a great opportunity I think it's forward thinking looking at what we can put in in the future and actually putting in the conduit in advance cabling and so on that we can stub in i think that that shows a lot of foresight yep yep, yep. we can definitely do that um part two of this is uh, more of an administrative piece but it's the right-of-way vacation um, so just like the cascade hall uh, we would vacate our right-of-way so essentially everything within the plaza area so from the back of the curb inward um, that's what's shown here uh, they split it down the center line of the road so 50 percent would go to the library 50 percent would go to cascade hall as the adjoining owners uh, we've been talking to the library same thing they did on the last one is once we vacate to them they then deed over to cmu so cmu would own the plaza itself and maintain the plaza um, the city would maintain all the right of way all the right way parking um, cmu would maintain their parking lot here um, and so that would be by ordinance and then a deed um, that gets signed so i'd have two readings on the upcoming meetings i guess as uh, add to that. as as the police department had a chance to review all this I haven't seen it. I have not. His request was a flagpole, so I made sure to accommodate. So in that, in that capacity, but. you know, one of the concerns we've had in the past is unwanted persons showing up in these areas, and I just want to make sure that you're comfortable for, with the coverage and everything that we might need. Yeah, I, I will say on that front too. This was designed, um, you know, even with the the full design kind of with that in mind. So we were talking, the library was involved with a lot of our designs and some of the issues they've had with you know, camping and things in their um, brush. So the, the way this was designed was to try and not um, foster camping and, and things of that sort. Um, that's why you see more concrete. Uh, you know, that was, that was taken into consideration with the design. I don't so, want to take Steve's thunder, but I also think that, you know, yeah. campus is, Go ahead. No, I, I, we've talked a lot about this, and one of the things that we did is strategic design so that we didn't have big, comfortable benches to lay on, that they were more benches with seating, like you see at an airport. It's really uncomfortable to sleep over the little barriers and that kind of thing. And uh, ground cover, so we didn't have trees and shrubbery that you could kind of nest up underneath and all that stuff. So we've given it quite a bit of thought. but. I think in addition, and maybe that's where the chief was really going, was that the lighting is so important here. Our, in the, our classes, both in the fall semester and the spring semester, the last classes get out at 8.50 p.m. And so all the lighting out there is super important for students to be able to get to it from their, from their cars. And in addition, that the parking lot that's actually the old Wells Fargo parking lot uh, where uh, All Points Transit comes through, you know, that's another one where our students park at late at night. So any any improvement to all the lighting on campus is really a welcome thing. And I think it does kind of mitigate what you're talking about. Thank you. One of the questions I had on that that just occurred to me is that, so we will be, once we vacate this right away, we will be deeding this little section of property to CMU. As a private owner, then they can enforce no trespassing. Or is that something that because you're a public institution that they would still be yeah, so difficult to enforce? we're state funded, so we're open and everything's open as long as you're not doing anything that's inappropriate. So we have a great relationship with the police department. 
anytime people are doing something that's you know not just weird but actually illegal, <laughs> we actually contact the police and they respond immediately. So it works out pretty good. We'll say though that we've had you know a great partnership as far as some of those times when you're obviously there not for that higher learning situation, and so we've had college calls too and we have to ask people to move along so I think it's been good. Excellent. So are, are there any other questions for uh, either Steve or Jim or Scott <coughs> or Ben or Blaine or <laughs> we're just kind of opening this one up. <laughs> Anybody that has a good answer would love to hear from I guess. All right thank you guys appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks Steve. Ben got something. You got anything to add? Yeah. We prepared all of the paperwork so that the transaction can occur. And because this was a two part or two phase transaction when it comes to the library district, I prepared that paperwork as well. So, assuming it's all approved by you and by the library board, this should go smoothly as far as I know at this point. And I know the library board's been pretty conducive toward that higher education as well. So, I think that'll be a Pretty seamless process, one would hope. So far as I know. Very good. All right, moving on to item E, our Otter Road right of way dedication. And this is Planning Manager Jace Hockwell and City Engineer Scott Murphy. Oh, you're yeah. sorry. Uh, good morning, Council. I'm just going to share my PowerPoint, PowerPoint here. Uh, pretty straightforward requests uh, that I'm bringing up today, and Scott can chime in with any additional things he has. Um, but City Council passed the Grove Preliminary Subdivision plat back uh, just about two weeks ago on March 21st. Uh, with that being approved, the applicant's actually hoping to start infrastructure construction, uh, and with that, Otter Road must be dedicated as city right of way first because it is the primary access point to the Grove Subdivision. Excuse me, the Grove Subdivision. Um, so as proposed, basically, we're just going through an official act of the city to dedicate approximately 680 feet, linear feet of right of way uh, that would be dedicated. Uh, just as kind of a refresher here, this is the preliminary plat for the Grove subdivision that was approved. Uh, Otter Road would sit on the very northern portion of this um, subdivision plat, and again, Phase one, as the developer is proposing, is that northernmost portion. So really the primary access is from Otter Road. And then lastly here is just the actual dedication plat. Um, so typically all rights of way are dedicated by developer at the time of the subdivision. However, this is kind of unique because it's actually owned by a separate entity. Uh, this kind of flag portion where the right of way is being dedicated. Um, so we, we had to work with Sunshine of Montrose um, with this dedication and they're willing to sign it. This will provide them future access uh, further to the east as well. Um, so no real issues there, but just kind of unique as, as to the ownership situation. And again, that's really a big reason for this, uh, this dedication as well. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to your all's attention. It will come to the regular meeting on uh, April 18th. But if you have any questions, I think Scott and I are happy to answer anything else that. I think we asked a lot of questions concerning this section of the road <coughs> and the development of it in our meeting about the preliminary plat. Mm -hmm. And we had discussed that they would build it to a certain standard with it being able to be expanded to future city standards at a later date to make sure that we are keeping that option open and keeping our uh, design standards at a good level. Another piece I was add that makes this unique too. So typically, yeah, like he said, they're typically dedicated with the um, subdivision, but they can't dedicate something that's not on their property. So that brings this. And what makes this one so the second tier to that is usually we can do them through a standalone deed. So like when we acquire right of way, it can be as simple as a two-page MOA purchase agreement with a, a deed for the right of way. What makes this one unique is you'll notice there's a little sliver there called tract I, I think it is. Uh, because the way of the auto road alignment, there would be a remnant parcel. So you can kind of have an illegal subdivision where you're deeding something 
uh, it's only a portion of the party property and leaves a remnant parcel. So that's what actually drove this to go to a full-on official act of the city is the cleanest way to do that. So usually um, these things don't have to be acted on if it's just a sole right-of-way dedication, but because there's a remnant parcel being created, this kind of gets platted and that tract becomes part of the HOA um, or remains just as an extension. It's already actually a good part of it. It's already landscaped with grass and all that. So kind of cleaning up some previous work as well. So two for <laughs> you like housekeeping. <clears throat> all right, any questions for staff? Uh, I had a question, but he answered it. Thank you, sir. Perfect. I like it when staff can proactively read our minds <laughs> to the point where they can just like, I know they're going to ask this question. All right. Very good. We're going to move on to item F. And this is our land use code consolidation update. And I will say that this, since this is kind of a little bit more uh, weighty and meaty, that if you have been here for some other portion of this meeting and you'd like to go ahead and leave, now be now's the time. <laughs> Run for the door. Because we're going to be digging in pretty deep, I think. So. All right, we're getting our consultant, yeah, our consultant team up here. Um, and actually, why don't we go ahead and take a couple minutes for a, a bio break, let everybody get set up. <laughs> That's the polite term for potty break now. So I'll watch out for my cable here. Okay. Wow. Well, we The only thing that I was concerned about and just yes. you know, that was <laughs> is there was some areas in there that Oh, oh. Yeah. So, 
She's got some Girl Scout cookies. I never turned down a Girl Scout cookie. <laughs> I have to be careful to only have one now, but I mean, it's like chips. Okay, you're a chip. Oh, yeah. They're like, they're kryptonite. Yeah. Where did you get these? How do you feel? Really good. good. You did a 5K over the weekend. Mm -hmm. I paid for it. Yeah, um, yeah it was really weird because so on the outside here, I was sore. Didn't run, obviously. No, I definitely, I knew I did it. That's awesome. All right. This morning. Well, if everybody's ready. We have some coffee, we have some Girl Scout cookies, we have an opportunity for everybody to take a break. We're all good. In case we'll we'll dive back in. And we have our land use code consolidation update. And we have a number of our consultants here today. And so we, since we're recording this, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm uh, Martin Miners with Plan Tools. I'm Jerry Dahl with the law firm in Lakewood. And our deputy city manager, Ann Morgan Taylor, has also been very deeply involved in this project. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to you guys and let you tell us kind of what you have been working on and what the plan is. Um, perfect. Well, yeah, thanks, council. There we go. Um, yeah, so as, as you all are probably keenly aware at this point, uh, we've been going through a code consolidation process, a land use code update process. We're looking at this as really a phase one of probably a multi-phase process, and I'll get into kind of what the timeline and, and future steps look like uh, closer to the end of the presentation. But um, we've got our introduction already from our, our consulting team who's really been working on this for, oh geez, probably about nine months. Year, just about a year, okay, um, before I actually started with the city. Uh, and really the, the whole goal of this, this process is to consolidate, bring everything into one unified section or one unified title, excuse me, and then um, just have it more modernized at the end of the day, more readable for our developers, uh, more readable for city staff, just have it more understandable overall. Um, just as far as the project schedule goes, this is kind of, uh, what's happened over the course of the last year. I uh, really did a deep uh, code review and diagnosis process um, in the spring to summer of last year. Uh, and then since that point in time, it's just been kind of nonstop uh, consolidation and, and updating of the code. So um, as far as the upcoming dates uh, today, we've got the, the work session and we really wanted to take a pretty deep dive into the substantive changes and some other components. 
Uh, we've got a scheduled uh, public and stakeholder open house with the Planning Commission invited that uh, is proposed right now on April 17th, uh, so just about two weeks from today. And then we've got first reading on May 2nd and second reading in mid-May on the 16th, uh, which would be adoption. So that's more or less just a quick intro. I'm gonna pass it over to Martin here and he will dive into the project objectives and go from there. All right, well thanks, Chase. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Martin Landers with Planet Tools. I'm one half of the consulting team along with Jerry Hall of MDVR. Uh, but this truly has been a collaborative process uh, with staff, working with Jace and Ann, Archie and Will and Ben, and a whole host of staff people uh, have really collaborated on this project. Um, what I really wanted to talk about was how the project began with the evaluation of the codes, and that we really understood that in order to, to get to the last bullet on this list of project objectives, which is to address the various code updates that were identified in the comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2021, we really had to do the first three items first uh, because we found in our code diagnosis that there are a lot of things that didn't work and what didn't work in particular was that the way the current codes are scattered throughout uh, the municipal code as well as a separate document, uh, the Montrose Regulations Manual. So we needed to be able to reorganize the city's land development regulations into a unified development code. Um, next slide, please. So when we look at uh, putting together a unified development code, we again looked at all the various regulations where they're currently hosted and reviewed all of those. And so you can see from this list, uh, we have regulations spread out in Title II, which is, uh, deals with the Planning Commission. Uh, under Chapter 4.2, we've got the flood management, Chapter 4.4 zoning, 4.7 subdivision regulations, 4.12 mobile home and travel home regulations. You can see how these are all over the municipal code. And then on top of that, under the Montrose Regulations Manual, we also had regulations, for example, on site development standards that were also repeated within uh, the Montrose Municipal Code. Same with the uh, cell tower and telecommunication facilities. So we had du duplicative regulations as well. So a big part of this was being able to say, okay, let's be able to consolidate all this information into one document uh, known as a Unified Development Code. So that's what we've done. Uh, the draft document that you have before you, next slide please, is um, the, known as Title 11, and Title 11 has 12, excuse me, 15 different chapters um, organized such that um, they're all under one heading of land development. And so, again, looking at the way that this is set up, uh, we have several uh, chapters, for example, uh, chapter one, general provisions, uh, chapter eight, site development standards, uh, chapter, uh, let's see, five, subdivision regulations, chapter four, development review procedures, where there are a number of different um, regulations that we pulled into one place. So now you can just go to, for example, development review procedures and see a chart that shows all the different development review procedures and then that's tied to various sections in the code where you can get additional detail. And Jerry's gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail here in a few minutes. Actually, he's gonna talk about it right now. Yeah, right now. <laughs> so, here, here, here we go. Uh, this is a chart out of uh, chapter four, and as Martin mentioned, key to any land use code, to be honest, is the development review procedures. If you're the developer, if you're the public, if you're staff, this is where it all happens, okay? Um, when do I apply, and what are the steps in my application? If I'm the developer, I really wanna know how many times do I have to come down here, City Hall, to get my project approved? And who do I have to come down in front of? And so what are the steps? Presently, the way the code's written, to find that information out, it's prose. You know, it's paragraphs scattered around. And you have to kind of stitch it together. And what we've done here is we've consolidated all that into this chart. And uh, the chart does a lot. And I want to spend a few minutes on it just because there's a lot of material that used to be a lot of words and now is in this uh, chart. So we consolidated all these into this chart. And uh, we've, uh, let me take you through it just a little bit or give you an example. 
Uh, if you're uh, a, uh, let's pick one that uh, isn't crossed by the horizontal line there. Let's pick one that will sort of work. Um, uh, for example, uh, let's see, uh, conditional use is just halfway down, just above the midline. See that? Conditional use. So, going across, that's the approval you want. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, just leave that arrow right there and don't move it around. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I don't know about the rest of you, but okay, fine. Conditional use. Yola, here's your, here's your little trip. You first, you stop for pre application. Uh, the arrow's moving. Leave it there. <laughs> I don't want to. Don't move the arrow. Don't move the arrow. <laughs> Who's doing that? Everybody, hands up. Hands up. Who is doing that? Okay, anyhow. It's uh, the wind blowing the arrow around. It is the wind. So it's conditional. You see, your first stop is pre application. There's a little X there. So that's a meeting with staff to go over pre app. And that's new to allow it to require a pre app so that the applicant can come in and staff can work with the applicant to say, okay, here are the things you got to worry about. Uh, this is what is going to make a complete application. Don't walk in with one and have signed it and there's four things missing. This is really to help the applicant and is to help the staff. So that's a really important role that you'll notice is true all the way down for just about, in fact, for every uh, form of, of application. Uh, now we continue to the right. The arrow's not moving. That's good. And uh, the CR is completeness review. We check it to make sure that the application is complete. So that again, you don't have the, oops, go back to square one kind of routine before you get going. Uh, moving on, it's referred, referral to uh, outside agencies typically. Uh, water district, sewer district, uh, power, those kinds of things. Can you supply power, is it the right place? Uh, as we continue to move on, this is the approval stage. AD is administrative and conditional use is not administrative. So that goes to public hearing, that's the H, in front of planning commission. And if the answer is one the applicant doesn't like, that's an opportunity for appeal. That's why there's an A to you at city council. Now let's distinguish that, say, from uh, oh, an administrative approval, a floodplain development permit. That's about the fourth one down. You'll notice the pre-app is only recommended. It's the one or two cases where you don't have to come in for pre-app. It's a little more straightforward. There's a completeness review and it goes straight to administrative approval. Uh, another example would be, for example, uh, uh, variance. You'll notice that's similar to a conditional use permit, isn't it? It's just below the midline there, where it's a hearing in front of planning commission appeal to council. But the one just above it, rezoning site specific, see that is just below our midline. That's an example of, of one that has pretty much the full vote, right? Mm -hmm. Pre app. Completeness review, it's referred to agencies, it's not administrative approval, hearings both in front of planning commission and city council. And if you're the developer, you go, okay, I want to learn what the standards for that are, there's your code section that lets you find the standards that are supportive. But you've avoided having to go to a lot of code sections uh, by just seeing the, uh, seeing the chart. And so that shows you all the stops along your development. A review and honestly I think it's also a tool and this won't be for phase one but as the city looks at how many times are we really forcing people to come in and is it too many or not enough and when it's pros you can't really tell but when, the, when it's in a chart it's really obvious how many times you've got to come in and, and it allows it's a policy making tool in my opinion to allow you to think about is this enough too many times enough times should it be just it should should be hearing instead of a meeting uh it's a important tool i will say that we haven't changed by and large what you're doing now we've just reflected it and as you get to phase two you may want to change some of that stuff so i have a question mr yeah. Dill. as a counselor and not an applicant i want to look down the column the city council column <laughs> Yep. and understand that column more than understanding a row. Yep. So in that column, if there is um, at an H, that means we're having a hearing in front of city council. Correct. And if there's mm -hmm. an A, that means we're only appealing the previous hearing from planning commission. Right. And if there's an X. That's a meeting, not a hearing. Okay. So, you know, and in practice, as we all know, 
uh, the public shows up, you know, the meeting looks a lot like a hearing. Okay. But you didn't have to publish notice okay. of that hearing. Okay. And so that helps me understand which items come to us in which fashion. So yes. in addition to it being helpful on the row, it's also helpful yeah. on the call. Fair enough. Yep. You're right. It really shows your role. And you can increase that role by putting more H's in your column, and you can, you know, decrease that role. It's a little bit of a dial. So uh, I'm sure at phase two, you'll have a chance to look at that. A couple of points on the bullet points on the left. Uh, now we've left the chart after the first two bullet points, and the rest are things that we did change in text. We added uh, a measure to improve staff comments by saying you've, you've got to uh, respond to staff comments on your application within 90 days or it's deemed withdrawn. You bring in an application, staff goes through the exercise of reviewing it and giving you comments and then it's crickets from the, from the applicant. You know, either move forward with it or not is the, the desire for that uh, bullet point. We also added some durations elsewhere in the code to uh, how long a development approval is valid. So that you don't have, for example, a, a sketch plan that just sits there forever because at some point you got to bring in your, your preliminary or really it's out of date and we've added a whole list that, that shows those terms which are generous 18 months three years six years depending or five years depending upon the nature of your approval one thing to add just from a staff level this is something that's seen across jurisdictions really when it comes to the to down to the response comments and the timing of those. So we also, we have a 90 day threshold that's pretty standard amongst most jurisdictions. We also have the ability to extend that uh, should the applicant need to. Sometimes there's title issues, a quiet title claim, um, some issues that actually do require more than 90 days. And we've, we've put kind of a, you know, a place in there to, to they can extend that 90 day period should they need to, so. I, I would perhaps argue that by coming to you and saying that we need more time, they are responding. Mm -hmm. And that's so. fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we like to, what we do, we provide a pretty, you know, um, it's it's just a consolidated list of comments from all, all agencies within the review process, and then we request that they respond to that. And that's, that's kind of the formal request with the documents that they present to. What we don't like to see too much is piecemealed um, documents come in kind of one at a time because it, it's really hard to track. But yeah, to that point, I think really we would just request, and, and we would track those, we do it now, um, but we would just track those time thresholds, and if it gets to, let's say, 75 days and we haven't received anything, we would reach out and say, hey, what's the, what's the status, and then we can update our system, and or we could extend it at that point in time. So. Just to piggyback on that point also, I think by having that pre-application conference now at the front end really helps with improving the ability to get applications processed on time. Because you're meeting with the applicant, you're letting them know exactly what is expected, what the time frames are, what the process is. So having that in there, I think, will also help with that response time. Uh, well, uh, if we like this chart, we're going to like the next one. So next slide. Uh, trying here. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, public notice requirements. Uh, now, these are public notice requirements for hearings, not for meetings. Meetings, it's just the open meetings law, you know, 24 hours ahead, you gotta put it on the agenda. But it's not a public hearing where you publish and post in your mail. Uh, this chart is public hearings where you're publishing, posting your mailing. So replace, on the previous chart there was an H uh, if I'm the, the applicant and I'm uh, doing a rezoning, for example. Uh, here's what I know I have to do. I've got to publish post and mail. Uh, for my rezoning public hearing, and that'd be the public hearing in front of the planning commission and in front of in front of the council, as I recall, on rezoning. We said there were hearings in both places uh, from our previous chart. Um, so this is exclusively, as I said, public hearing notices. We put them in this chart. Uh, you should know on the bullets on the left in text, because there's text sections that relate to this to say, if you've got to publish under the chart, here's what publishing means. If you've got a post under the chart, here's what posting, here's your posting requirement. If you've got to mail it, here's the requirement. We did expand the mail notice in the text from 100 feet to 300 feet. And this is a recommendation staff. Very honestly, it's, uh, that's a much better number 
that I see in city state wide. It's really you know, 100 feet doesn't. There are people that are upset that they did not. Either. Come on, I'm right. I'm right there. How come I didn't get a notice? Then there are the people that show up at the hearing. I love this and say, you know, I never got a notice of this hearing, and they proceed to testify and go, well, but you're here. <laughs> there's, there's always so because I didn't get a notice, you can't say yes to this application. But they're here. I'm sorry, that's just a hobby horse of mine. But we all have experienced that, have we not? We have. Okay. Uh, in any event, we added two permissive things. Uh, uh, the, the permissive opportunity to do email notice and, uh, and also the ability to combine notifications for planning commission and city council if you already know when the council hearing is going to be in addition to the planning commission hearing. You publish a notice of public hearings. The application for the rezone of XYZ property be heard by planning commission on this date, time, and place and by city council at this time and place. Sometimes you don't know when the city council hearing will be and so the planning commission hearing notice is just its own. Uh, lastly, again permissively, uh, uh, expanding to permit neighborhood meetings for all forms of development. Previously in the code it was just for subdivision, but uh, we've made it available and, and said that the applicant should consider neighborhood meetings for any application uh, because it's, it's useful, it's critical. If, there's going to be neighborhood opposition. Uh, you want to find that out in more of an informal context. You're not bound to things that are done or said in a neighborhood meeting. It's really kind of on the applicant to reach out to the to the neighborhood. Uh, so that's that's a quick thumbnail sketch on on uh, notices. Bringing us to uh, the use the chart. Use chart, right? Uh, I think it's the last chart for a while, but. Uh, yeah, so this it's is one additional chart that we've done to consolidate a lot of information into one place, continuing to put the code on a diet. Um, and it really does improve the usability of, of the code, just like the other charts. So on this particular chart, uh, you'll see the zoning districts uh, listed along the top side of it. And this one's specific to residential uses. We also have a separate chart for non-residential uses, but this chart itself is is all about the residential uses and the types of uses that are within residential districts. Um, along the left-hand side then are various columns, and you can see that we've got those broke down by the commercial, institutional, recreational, residential. So as you know, even within a residential district, for example, you can have recreational uses, and so that's why those are listed here. Um, we set it up so that in the legend you'll see there are permitted uses by P. That's same as what you have right now in terms of use by right. That's known as a permitted use. The conditional uses are listed as C's, and the accessory uses, the temporary uses are A's and T's. So just taking one example, I don't know where you want to put that cursor, uh, <laughs> but I don't know where you can put the cursor. Out. Yeah, let's care. pick one. All right, childcare facilities. Um, those are all um, shown as C, conditional uses, in every residential district. Uh, in the code, they're also defined separately from family child care homes, which are permitted uses in all the districts. And it's really a matter of impact between the two different types of uses. Where's our OR um, code? I mean, don't we have an office residential? It is, and that's a very good question. We decided that was a mixed use because it's both okay. commercial and residential, and we have that on the non-residential. It's actually called mixed use and non-residential. Okay. So there are more pages of this yes. the chart. Whereas in the others, you saw the whole chart. This is a page of yeah. This is one example. Multi-page chart. Well, I think a great other highlight is the religious assembly, where you can build a church. Then, since it's actually differentiated between the different zoning categories, mm -hmm. some it's conditional, some it's permitted. Right. And we didn't really eliminate or change uh, any uses that you currently have allowed. For example, churches, religious assembly. If there's nothing, that means it's not allowed? Correct. That's okay. right. Yeah. If, if we don't show anything, it's prohibited, basically. It feels like there ought to, it ought to say that. I kind of agree. I think putting in a, some kind of not allowed. marker that let them know it is not allowed. We actually do have some text yeah, at the bottom of the chart that does not allowed. say that. Yeah, we have a section yeah. called Use is Not Listed. And so um, right up the section is about permitted use, conditional use. Accessory temporary, we have uses not listed. So there's some text associated with this chart, okay. but yeah, that is identified. But it basically takes all of our text 
and puts it into a chart that's a little easier to scan rows and columns right. for what you're looking for? Right now, you have um, a very pyramidical type of zoning district set up where um, you go through each district and they list the uses that are used by right, and then they list all the uses that are conditional. Then you go to the next zoning district and it says, all the uses in that previous district plus. are are allowed plus these seven different uses. All the uses in the conditional are allowed plus these six conditional uses. And so, so you I end up with pages and pages and pages of, of talking about the same thing where you could reflect that in one chart. So like back to your point, you could actually yeah. Yeah. Ed and I have a background in construction an and I hang on, I can't hear you. Put like an N uh -huh. down here for a description is this it just says not loud. That, uh, that's my suggestion. We could certainly do I that. Mean, they, yeah. Yeah, I respect that. that they do this lots of places and they kind of know what works. But Yeah. Blank e means prohibited or something. We'll come to some text there under the, um, in that chart that'll let people know. What's it mean if, for Not example, allowed. in bed and breakfast, we don't show anything in R1. Well, right. why, is, why is there a space there? Yeah. Not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> um, we also resolve a number of conflicts, inconsistencies. Little skull and crossbones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, certain of these use listings, for example, I was just talking about how this is a pyramidical type of uh, code, and you start looking at, you know, going back and forth between these different districts, and you find out that it's not consistent. There, there's a lot of inconsistencies, and I can tell you about a few of them. Uh, for example, there's multiple similar uses that are retained as only one use. So, for example, we have building material businesses, building material sales establishments, and retail building material supply businesses. And now we're just going to call them building material businesses. So we're cleaning all that up. I mean, in addition yeah. to putting the code into a nice, easy to read chart, we're also cleaning all that stuff. Yes. Good. Yeah. Yep. That's just one example. There's, there's several others that you can get just to think of all well. the trees we're going to save. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Uh, recently, I've been reading about uh, the new legislation that's uh, being promoted by the governor and the legislature. Uh, have we, as a group or consultants, looked at how that might impact uh, this, especially when it comes to uh, this, uh, these uh, uh, land use? Uh, where it's permissible, where it's not. I'd change it off. Uh, uh, I was just curious. I haven't read a whole lot about it, but <clears throat> I've just noticed that recently there's been a lot of uh, bringing it up. And, yeah. yeah Do you, you know what's nice, Ed, is when it changes, we if it changes, we update it. So a really good yeah. example from right before you were on council is the state said that in-home child care had to be allowed in every residential district. So when the state legislature passed that, at the local level, we updated ours to now reflect that in-home daycare is allowed in any residential district. So I'm sure the short answer is, if the state changes it, we'll update our code. Okay, so uh, <laughs> that's, that's a very short answer. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. the point. Without there, diving into that particular mm -hmm. piece of legislation. Yeah. And actually we will, at the end of this work session, we will be discussing Senate Bill 23, or 23-213. Yeah, so we're going we're to talk about that a little bit at the end of this. Okay. You might just note how thankful I am to have this process be wrapping up right now before we begin possibly making not only the changes that we know we want to make as a community to reflect our comprehensive plan, but perhaps changes that are not our decision if this legislation passes because we're in a much better spot to make those changes in a clear manner that we understand and our community can understand than, than we would have been um, as, we, as we stand right now. So the timing is, is good for us and thank you again for all the work you've done to get us in that place. Mm -hmm. One thing I will point out in terms of uh, adding the use, because we really haven't added new uses here yet either. That's again a phase two type of item that we wanted to do. It's more substantive uh, type of thing. But one thing we did add had to do with group homes in order to comply with the Fair Housing Act. Yep. Yeah. And you see them on the chart uh, below the midline there as permitted group homes. Uh, uh, up to eight as permitted uses in those residential zone districts and uh, nine and up as conditional uses in those residential districts. And 
Uh, for that purpose, let's uh, turn to the next slide, and I can tell you about the law a little bit on group homes. And that is a, a use that was added. It wasn't present in the code. There are group homes that are, I'm sure exist. Um, this is federal law, both the, the 1988 um, Fair Housing Act amendments and various federal cases that say, look, uh, you need to allow as a use by right uh, disabled persons to live in a group home setting in residential districts. The theory being that, uh, that the disabled community needs to be able to have the same residential experience that a family of eight Norwegians that are related to each other, Norwegian, so I get to lean on them, get to live together. And if you're, and, and especially for uh, various groups of disabled persons, that's the only way they can live in a residential setting, in a group setting with uh, some care individuals. And the, the federal law is very clear that that is a program it says you've, you've got to allow them access to your programs. And people think, well, doesn't that mean uh, uh, curb cuts and you know uh, uh, wheelchair ramps on sidewalks? Yes, that's a program that you need to allow the disabled to, to make al uh, alterations to allow the disabled to equally use that program, the sidewalk, in the same way that an able-bodied person can. But the courts have been very clear in holding that zoning regulations are also a program and you're letting that Norwegian family live in this residential zone district as a use by right, you need to allow a group home for disabled persons to be to have that same opportunity. Uh, there are limits to that. And interestingly, the federal law doesn't have a number. People always ask me, well, what's the number that is a use by right? How big can the group home be before it becomes a conditional use or an institutional use that you can fairly and, and certainly practically under the law allowing in, in commercial zone districts. And there's no number in the federal law. And the case law is kind of, is sort of all over the map. And you have to like pick the cases where it was too small and you got denied, and the case where it was, you know, large enough that it got approved. Uh, but the, the, and you're saying, well, did you just throw a dart at the wall? And the answer is no. The second bullet is the eight persons is also consistent with the state statute on that very subject. And that, in my opinion, gives uh, cities real good cover in terms of saying this is a number that's been recognized by the state legislature for, in that particular case, developmentally disabled. But that's a really good analogy. Uh, and the, I think the case law favors a number around this, this point. I will tell you there's some jurisdictions that go with a smaller number and some that go with a larger. But this is really consistent with the state statute. People are used to seeing it. And that also includes the additional necessary persons involved in the care. Uh, so that's what we have done. And we've got text material in uh, the code in chapter 11 that, that uh, describes the requirements for group homes. Among other things, uh, they have to comply with the health safety parking codes. It's uh, large group homes are a conditional use by nine. In that eight persons, if I hear you right, that would be the people who are living there. That does not include the persons who are assisting them. That's correct. That's correct. The law's program clear staff. That uh, whatever number you pick, it's also important to say plus such additional persons as necessary to care for those persons. Uh, there is a very often neighborhood resistance. I will tell you that I'm the city attorney for City of Wheat Ridge, and they have a couple of group homes that. that you know, they've had to struggle with in terms of neighbor uh, neighbor resistance. And it's been, I will say, an educational process that the city has reached out to say, these are requirements of the law. And uh, these homes need to be able to be in these residential districts, but there are limits. And among other things, the city, uh, when the neighbors were resistant, there was too much traffic and too many cars. Well, you know, all those Norwegians can have cars too. You know, every, every time there's an objection, and I'll get off the soapbox in a minute, you have to think about, well, what about the family next door that has five teenage kids and they've all got a car? Much the same impact, but gee, they're, they're related by blood and marriage, so we kind of give them a pass. How, do, how does that interface with a home business? Because in a home business, it has to be 
contained within yep. the within yep. the home, and there's some exactly. traffic restrictions yep. on that too. Yeah, home business, you absolutely can restrict. You can you can restrict to a much greater degree, but where the business effectively, and it's often a business, and I'm glad you asked that question because the 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 push is always well, wait, they're running a business here. Because often it's a it's a company their their company's profit not profit that will buy homes, renovate them, and use them and make them available for group homes for disabled. And the neighborhood opposition often is well wait that's a business, but really it's one of the ways the disabled are allowed or can can find a mechanism to be able to live in a group home. It's not like you're going to invent that yourself. There there are providers. Uh, the, the key for me is finding a number and having a number that matches up I think, with the state statute, saying that uh, the, there are certain parking and landscaping requirements that would apply to the commercial aspect of the home you can regulate. And then importantly, community outreach, I guess. Uh, one of the things that the city of Wheat Ridge did for this particular home was to uh, uh, engage a mediator, a mediation service, to really get these people talking to each other. Uh, so it's less about the regulations, more about, you know, in the end, if you talk to your neighbors, all of a sudden the, the jazz they're playing in the afternoon isn't bothering you because you know who they are. And I think that's a really, now I'm way off the regulatory end, but it's, I think, a really necessary adjunct to make the regulatory program successful. Otherwise, everyone's just mad that you have imposed this group home on that quiet neighborhood street. And I'm just alerting you to the fact that it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that federal law is laying on you, and that there are good reasons for it, and the state law is doing it as well. But I think we've crafted uh, a provision that, that does the job, satisfies the law, and, and gives you the tools to work with. Just to follow up on your, your question regarding home occupations, because anybody could have that question, right? Look at the code and go, well, where do I figure that out? We have separate definitions for group homes versus home occupations, as well as separate standards. So when you look at those standards, you'll see that only the residents of the dwelling unit may be engaged in the home occupation. So that's where you begin to see some of the distinctions between uses in the code, that we've actually defined the uses of being separate and distinct. Thank you. Fair enough, should we want to talk about cell towers? That's next. Who's going to finish? It's, it's about five seconds delayed for whatever reason. A little delay, just run. There we go. <laughs> uh, here, we uh, mostly we consolidated what you have, but there, there are some things that are new. Uh, you already had regulations for water communication cell towers. Some of them were in the regs, not the code. It's an example of situations which were moving things from those regs into, into the code. Uh, they're consolidated. We added the, the federal statute uh, requires that you process wireless communication applications for towers and, and antennas under a schedule because the industry was very concerned that cities were sitting on these applications and not processing them, and they got the, the Congress to enact the strict uh, time frame. So there's sort of a shot clock, if you will, for if it's a small facility, it's one number. If it's a big tower, it's another number. But we've incorporated those numbers. You don't see them here. This is just a description. We've incorporated those numbers into the code so that you're compliant with the federal processing uh, deadlines. What One new aspect is the review procedure for small cells and networks. Small cells are these uh, uh, not the antennas of the towers, but they're the things that you see sometimes built into street lamps, uh, sometimes a little monopole kind of thing that's in a neighborhood, and uh, those need to be uh, permitted. The state statute requires them as uses by right, believe it or not, in all zone districts. Thank you very much, state legislature preemption. Th thanks for that. But they're, they're now, uh, and the industry pushed that and when you think about it, we push that too, because we want that data. And we're on our phones all the time. We want to be able to get that video no matter where we are. And the industry says, if you want that, if you're demanding that, then we're going to have to have a small cell that is relays in between the larger facilities. Uh, so the impact on, lo on, on local neighborhoods is such that 
one of the things we made sure we did for the review procedure for small cells and the standards for small cells is to make sure that we dealt with the height design location spacing because the core storage you hear, what you've seen is somebody wakes up in the morning and uh, they're seeing the, the company put up a monopole mid-block and in front of their yard, in the right-of-way, but right in front of their yard. So one of the things that's easily done, and we've done it here, is to say, when you're going to do that, it's got to be in an existing pole if there is one, a new pole to replace an existing pole. It can't be mid-property, <coughs> you know, mid, right in the middle of a, of a lot. It has to be on the common property line extended out into the street. So the fence between you and your neighbor, and then there's a pole. You'd rather not have a pole at all, but at least it's not in your living room window. And these little things, I think, make a big impact locally at the neighborhood level. Yeah, and that's why we've done that. Many of our subdivisions now, all of the infrastructure's in the ground, so we don't even have any poles. It's, it's true. And you will see some poles occasionally, because there are use by right in all zone districts. But um, we've put together kind of a list of priorities. You've got to find a pole first, and if you can't find a pole uh, that's a city pole, you've got to find a, uh, another utility pole. You've got to f but you're right, there are the new developments uh, out by the golf course. That, there are no poles, are there, hardly? But there might be some street lights, so that's an opportunity. Okay. Uh, and you can design a street light to also be a, and we drive past them all the time without knowing it now. Uh, but that's the goal here, because left to their own devices, I'm not trying to be hard on the industry, but it's cheaper. They've got their stuff in stock, and unless they're required to redesign one of your light poles and add an antenna to it, they won't put in their own pole. Unless they're required to put it on a pro common property line extended in the street, they'll put it where they, you know, they'll put it in the right of way somewhere. And the, the whole effort here is to accommodate the fact that the industry's got both state and federal backing to require you to be there, or will require them to be there, but uh, under the conditions that produce the least impact. So that's what we've done in this chapter. And I think I get to turn it over to uh, Jace, I think. Yeah, this is something I wanted to bring up. I know there's always a lot of questions on what's the difference between modular and manufactured housing and homes. Um, so we have separate definitions. We have, I should say we have them in our current code. They're rather confusing, I'll say that. Um, I think if we get a call, we, we had a lot of internal debate actually on it and how they were defined as well as with the consulting team. Um, so we sat down with our building department to, to try to get a better understanding of exactly the definitions and what truly um, defines modular versus uh, manufactured. So there's new definitions for modular and manufactured, and I'll just read them verbatim as they're currently proposed. Uh, modular housing means single family, duplex, or multifamily housing, substantially or entirely manufactured in a factory which are moved on site and substantial uh, component parts are placed on a permanent foundation, are not self-propelled, and which meet or exceed on an equivalent engineering basis standards established by the city's building code. The homes will bear an insignia labeled as factory built unit certification, and these are which are typically found under the kitchen sink. So verbatim, um, and actually the illustration on the right, bottom right hand side, that is the tag that you would get for a modular house or a modular um, housing structure. And modular can be a single family home, it can be a duplex, it can be multifamily. Um, we saw the, uh, the hotel come in, um, that would be kind of the example of that multi-unit type structure, but that is the insignia and we wanted to capture that within the definition. So if we get a phone call from a staff level and someone says, I wanna build a man, I wanna put a manufactured house on site, we'll say, is it manufactured or is it mobile? And here's how you tell. Um, and then they'll be able to give us a clear description because we have them uh, separated out within our use table, which I'll get into a little bit here. But well, now I'm curious, does the Fairfield actually each unit that they did a module have a sticker or does just one sticker suffice for the entire structure? I believe for a multi, uh, for it, 
I believe it's one per per structure, basically. And, and that's not multifamily. And that's not multifamily. That would it's be commercial. non-residential, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a little bit different, albeit they're probably built in a very similar fashion. Um, but that would be a, a totally different style. I believe multifamily um, junction just Grand Junction just had a facility down by the river. Um, it is under all sinks in each and every unit. And we changed our code to allow this in multifamily in certain zoned areas because we thought that the base camp apartments were going to be this kind of construction. So we allow it as part of a PD uh, for okay. modular housing and manufactured housing we do not. So manufactured housing is just allowed within the R5, R6, and MHR districts. Um, modular housing is within those same districts and then it's allowed in a PD in any district. In any district. So okay. they would have to go still through the PD, PD process, process, but it would be allowed, whereas manufactured, regardless of the PD process, would, okay. would be allowed. Um, so definitely uh, something to keep in mind, but I'll jump into the manufactured housing definition we've got verbatim here, just so you also can hear that. Um, manufactured housing means single family homes substantially or entirely manufactured in a factory which are moved on site and substantial component parts are placed on a permanent or temporary foundation that's kind of a key here and are not self-propelled and which are manufactured certified and labeled pursuant to 42 usc 5401 uh, or certified by the colorado division of housing um, and affixed with a certification label also known as a hud tag uh, on the outside of the home. So the HUD tag, it refers to that red tag on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Those are always affixed on manufactured homes, and manufactured homes are just that. They are manufactured single-family dwellings. You don't have manufactured multifamily. Um, that's really a modular construction type. And it sounds like what you're saying is manufactured homes don't fall under our local building code. So a manufactured mm -hmm. home wouldn't touch base with Archie, for example. It, it would only for the uh, for the fact that it would require a siting permit. So it's okay. not a full-blown building inspection um, that, that goes with that. It's, just, it's simply just a siting permit. So where Archie's not going in and checking all the interior components. Um, okay. and, and he wouldn't necessarily be doing that with a modular either because that would be certified by the state. But it would require a building permit. It would also require an engineered foundation. Say that again. It requires an engineered foundation. Correct. Modular does. Yeah. Modular. Yeah. Whereas manufactured can be permanent. It can be, uh, or it could be temporary. So it kind of gives mm -hmm. that allowance for both. So another fine distinction I'd like to make sure we point out is that self-propelled. Because one of the things that when I was on the county planning commission, we had people saying, "Oh, but but this is a modular home." It's like, no, it's an RV. Right. It is <laughs> not a modular mm -hmm. home or a, a manufactured home. Yep, and clear distinction we wanted to make. And again, there is a lot of discussion internally on this. So <coughs> there's, a, uh, quite frankly, a lot of confusion on, on this. And we felt these definitions were really as best they could be to describe to the public and to be able to just answer calls uh, really across the board from any staff member uh, on, a, on a staff level. So. And it keeps in place what we've been doing. So the confusion was mostly as we get new staff members and work with new members of the public and also consultants who say to us, um, when I read your code, I don't understand what you mean and what the difference is. So internally, we, we knew and we plan to implement it right now the same way as we have been. Um, but now it's clear clearer to our staff members and our consultants what, what we mean by these terms. And it, it may be that during phase two, we propose some changes. Maybe maybe council wants to think about expanding where modular homes can be, or maybe the state legislature tells us we need to expand where modular homes can be. We're not doing that right now. Okay. So there's no policy change. We're not from digging into whether approved. a fifth wheel counts as a modular or a manufactured mm -hmm. home at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Ann. I'll jump ahead. I know we're running a little low on time here, so we're closing them to the end. <laughs> Planning Commission, that's uh, that's me. We re relocated the stuff that was in Title II uh, to this new chapter. Uh, I do want to point out a couple things we did. The Planning Commission in the present code can initiate rezoning applications. And I will tell you, that's odd. And I've never seen that anywhere. Uh, they're not the owner of the property. It's, it's just not uh, a, a 
appropriate role. The owner of the property is. Now, it's also true, though, that under the present code, and it needs to remain this way, the city manager can come to you with that, as can the city council can initiate rezoning on specific parcels of property, because you have that power. That is your role, and you have that uh, power. But the planning commission, no. Now, they'll see it. Remember our review chart? They'll see it in public hearings. So they'll be able to, to weigh in on it, but not to say, hi, we, we believe that we're going to initiate an application to rezone lot one, block two, from this to that. That's not an appropriate role uh, for them. Um, we clarified the sketch plan review procedure right now. It's a, the, what we do is we, we made clear what is happening, which is the Planning Commission review of the sketch plan is not a hearing, and they don't take any action. They don't vote. So it's, well, why are we here and what are we doing? And that, that understandably can be a little unclear to people. It's a meeting in the review chart that we saw, but there's no action taken. So we made it clear in the code that uh, public comments, and comments by the commission are recorded in minutes, made a part of that application package as it moves through the process. And that's what you're doing now, but it just wasn't clear. And I think there was a failure of expectation if I'm on the commission or an applicant, well, are you going to vote now that we've had, you know, this this meeting? And uh, we made it clear that no, no voting is necessary. But whatever you say is not being lost, especially for the public. And you came and you gave your testimony to the commission. We want to make sure people knew that was not being uh, lost. We made it clear there are alternate members that can be appointed to the planning commission. And if there are a couple of them and there's one spot open that night, who gets to be the, the voting person, and we apply the rule that's used elsewhere, which is you get to be the voting person in the order of your seniority of appointment as a as an alternate member, and that way everyone knows. Uh, and lastly, we, we dealt with the uh, opportunity for tie votes on the commission. That can happen. you got an even number of people. I was in a meeting in Hayden just two weeks ago where that happened, and the planning commission said, well, I guess we're done, because the motion to approve failed on a Two, two, and I said, no, you're not done. You know, your job, you have not made any recommendation. And we've made it clear in the code here that a tie vote is not a recommendation. You haven't done the job yet. You've either got to move to recommend approval or move to recommend denial. And if you continue to fail to get any motion passed, then we provide them the code that comes up to council. Because you don't want to stall out an application because of a, of a tie vote. So we've provided uh, for that. So those are the changes to the Planning Commission. Not a lot of new material, but some kind of processing things. And that last one, um, that was, we faced that actually just four months ago. It was something that came up. There was a tie vote, three, three vote. Um, they could not get to anything. And our current code doesn't really distinguish what the next step is. It's unclear. Um, that applicant actually ended up kind of revising their application and coming back in. But um, I think this is a safety measure for that to, quite frankly, just not happen again. Uh, on the next slide, at least part of the next slide, which is uh, some other changes. Uh, the, uh, there have been a couple of uh, decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court on sign regulations. You're probably familiar with this Reed versus Gilbert. Gilbert's a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, scrubbing content restrictions out of your sign code. So we don't have real estate signs, political signs anymore. We've got site signs, window signs. You describe them by by their physical features, not their content. And largely, your code had, had done that. There were a couple of, uh, at least one remaining content-based restriction or clarification that we removed. But it was, we finished the scrubbing process, but you largely done it. And since the Reed case, the Supreme Court decided the city of Austin case, which lightened up a little bit on off-premise signs because you know you don't know it's an off-premise sign without reading the content of the sign, right? So isn't that a content restriction? And uh, the Supreme Court lightened up on that and gave room for cities to be able to say, a sign that doesn't advertise products or services available on the site is an off-premise sign, and you can either say yes or no to that. And so we've, we've added language that, that implements uh, the flexibility granted by the Supreme Court in that case. So those are just two kind of smaller substantive changes, but we have made them, and I think, Martin, you've got the next. Yeah, we've, we've made a few more as well. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll hit a couple of highlights here, uh, one of which is that we've added um, 
exemption for duplexes under the site development plan process. Right now, you exempt single family homes from that, farms, uh, let's see what else, any building additions less than 25% of the existing building size that are also less than 4,000 square feet. Um, airport facilities are subject to federal regulations. The one additional one that we added was for duplexes. So essentially removing a barrier to that type of, of review for that type of housing. Um, preliminary final plats, we've added some review and approval criteria. So it's very clear as to what type of criteria should be evaluated when you are evaluating a preliminary plat or a final plat approval uh, in that process. Um, we had some basic life health safety provisions for industrial performance um, into the supplemental use regulations. So you've got that now in your code. We added common interest community provisions for condominiums as part of the subdivision regulations <coughs> under the minor subdivision process, which essentially clarifies how you treat condominiums or townhomes that are on one single lot where they essentially just sell sublots. All that now is built into the code. We have some other uh, substantive changes that we'd like to list for you uh, and include in your packets. So you don't have to work through all those red lines and try to figure out. 90% of those red lines are minor changes, but there's some meat here and there. We wanna pull that out and, and let you know specifically what they are, like this list. So we'll have that list for you by chapter when we submit this for your review at public hearing. So. One other thing that we wanted to point out was that all of these documents are currently available for public review on our project website. This website's been up since we started the project. Um, it's really a location where people can go, um, find out background information regarding what we've been working on, uh, the schedule for the project, meeting minutes. Uh, I think this is the third work session we've had. We've included the presentations and information from the first two work sessions. We'll add this presentation to that website as well. Um, we also have a contact form on there, so if people have questions, they can get a hold of us and, and uh, we can then respond. And then lastly, um, the open house I mentioned on the front end, so that'll be in two weeks. Um, it, for something like this, a text change like this, it doesn't go to Planning Commission for their approval, but we'll be inviting them to that open house as well as the stakeholders involved. And um, you know, this isn't, at the end of the day, this isn't really a sexy code update. You, see, you hear a lot of communities right now going through very controversial code updates. A lot of Western Slope communities, uh, for that matter. Uh, this is really a consolidation. This is really the groundwork, as I see it, of uh, kind of beefing up our code as we move forward. So we look at it as phase one of a multi-phase uh, approach as we, as we really continue to to move forward um, and those future phases will really look at the comp plan and how to implement the comp plan within the existing code. So we certainly do it here to some extent. Um, one, of the, one of the things we have as an action item is to actually very clearly identify the difference between modular and manufactured housing. I think we succeeded uh, in this round, but there's a number of other objectives um, that we'll, we'll look to for the future phases moving forward. Um, so with that, we have a housing needs assessment, as you all are aware, that's still about uh, probably four to six weeks out, um, but that will likely drive some things as well uh, for, for council to look into uh, and to give staff guidance on of what they might wanna see in, in the future phases. So um, I'll, I'll end it with that, unless there's anything else to add. Um, yeah. I might just say that um Jesus' point is really important because Council, you directed us to start on this process in order to implement our comprehensive plan. So as a reminder, that's how it started. And as Martin and Jerry showed you today, we realized we had more work to do foundationally. So we've done that and we are now, after this meeting, meeting with Martin and Jerry to start on that phase two. So we're working on it, we'll get our housing needs assessment back and we'll move forward. And um, the reason that council directed us to work with consultants at the time was because you knew that our capacity as a as staff was limited to work on a big project like this. So um, Ben wasn't with us at that time, um, but I just wanted to remind, especially as he embarks on his review today, that the reason we're working with consultants isn't because we lack the, the intelligence or 
or the skills on our staff, but we really do lack the time and it's been wonderful to work with consultants to get this done. I really think that it would not have been possible to make this much progress without the extra capacity that um, Martin and Jerry have given us. So thank you council for allowing us the funding to work with consultants. And also just as a reminder, it's not because we didn't feel like we, we weren't smart enough here internally, um, but we really couldn't do it all um, with the, especially the um, increased development applications that we've seen over the last year. So I um, wanted to note that and see how um, helpful Ben has been in the process. He's joined us at every land use retreat in order to make sure that he understands and agrees with all of the changes that we've been making and can be helpful then once we implement this new code um, and answer questions that staff may have for him or that you may have for him as well. And I'll just note also that from a consultant standpoint, uh, having this staff to work with has resulted in a very high quality document that we typically would not get because your staff has been very engaged in this. Very helpful. And I'll also point out, is Scott still in the room? Scott, yeah. I forgot to mention him at the beginning. He's mm -hmm. also been very helpful uh, with all the site development standards, relationship to engineering. So to have this level of, of staff involvement is has been critical to, to the work that we do. From my perspective, both professionally and from being an elected official, I think this has been an excellent process because, uh, like Ann said, we didn't doubt the ability of our staff, but having that outside perspective and that specialized areas of expertise has been invaluable. So we've really, I think, gotten a great benefit from having you gentlemen involved in the process. So thank you. I have two I have two questions. That meeting on the 17th, mm -hmm. do you have a time and can Lisa put that on the council calendar when you get one? Yep, definitely. Time and a date? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Please. so right now it's, I think, tentatively scheduled for six. Really, we've reserved this room. It will be in this room. We wanted to kind of just get your firm guidance as to a green light. We wanted to make sure there was no total red flags that we had to go back to the drawing board on. Uh, and so, we will we'll get that up ASAP. We'll actually start to, to get information out ASAP okay. on that. And then Ben, big picture, all these revisions, and simultaneously, we've got a charter revision committee working. Is there anywhere that they overlap and anything that's happening on this that would need to be reflected and updated in our charter code? And if so, I would think you'd be the common link between these changes and those changes and just to think about that. The answer may be they don't intersect anywhere. Nothing is coming to mind. Okay. Um, I think that's a good thing to keep our eyes out for right. as we go through the charter though. We have the opportunity to reflect if there are any changes that then make our charter incorrect, we have the opportunity to add those to our list of charter changes. Mm -hmm. When it comes to anything land use planning commission wise, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. sure. The Planning Commission bylaws are in our, our parking lot or our how corral to make sure that we look at, um, to make sure that they're consistent with a couple of the changes that we made. So that's on our radar and Ben will of course be helping us with that. <coughs> cool, thank you. Um, well, I think it's great how well you guys have blended this in and worked it together. I think staff's done a great job. Okay. Uh, I only had one uh, question that raised the flag for me and and perhaps uh, it, uh, it's uh, city staff, but uh, I noticed that there was a few places in the, the revisions that specifically took out uh, the language that referred to staff or an appointed person and specifically made the manager uh, the, the go-to person. Uh, and I know that, uh, for example, in the uh, floodplain, uh, what happens if, lo and behold, the city manager's washed out with the dam and who's gonna be responsible for that? And I don't know if there's anything specific in the city charter or city plan or anything like that that might have an effect on that. And uh, uh, there was another one in particular that caught my attention was on a review, uh, his, the city managers uh, had the final uh, 
uh, say so unless the court had the that. And I was thinking that, uh, you know, uh, how does that work? And again, uh, that might have been a, a question for the attorney, but I, I was just curious as to, to uh, why the staff and, and counsel were circumvented and left out of some of those decisions. That's let me start and I'll turn over to Jerry yes, real quick just in terms of your first question uh, regarding the floodplain being washed out. Uh, we define city manager in here uh, as or his designee. Uh, so that's what was washed out. Well, it was the a designee. In the text it was washed out, but what we did was we included that then in the definition section. So now in the definitions, in one place you'll see wherever it says city manager, the definition for city manager means or his designee. Okay. So that, so that's that, that answers that piece of it. But I'll let Jerry hit your second part. Yeah. The, the point you make about the city manager being the final decision maker, uh, and again, it's the manager designee, but that's for things that are purely administrative. In other words, not the, not anything in the review in the review chart where council and the planning commission are the ones taking the action. Those actions are the final decision of the city. So on a rezoning, for example, it's it's the council that's the final action. But for example, on issuing or not issuing a building permit or a construction permit or uh, any of the others that were the AD uh, under the where it says AD uh, administrative and we're our column there. Uh, perfect. Th thanks whoever put that slide up. That's beautiful. <laughs> that's great. So that's why the slide's so great. But for example on a sign permit, that's administrative. If somebody doesn't like the fact that a sign permit got denied, they're not appealing that to council. The city manager's decision is final, and if I'm mad that I didn't get my sign permit, my next stop after the city manager's decision is going to have to be district court. And it's important for the code to say that. But it does not take away, if that was the concern, I understand it, doesn't take away from the authority of the council where the city council or planning commission, the final decision maker, the chart says so. Yeah, because I was just thinking about uh, uh, it just seemed like some of the stuff was pretty trivial that he could have signed it to, to somebody at the staff level. Uh, but it, in my reading of this, and again, uh, I read the whole thing, and so I was uh, uh, concerned that, that uh, uh, making him responsible for everything uh, just kind of, uh, uh, I mean, he's got a lot on his plate not to mention adding uh, a, whole, a whole bunch more. And, uh, Special magical words, or his designation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you know, the manager, the buck does stop with you, but then on a given, for example, on sign prints or whatever, he might consistently be delegating that to a staff person, whoever it is he's delegating it to. I like your point okay. though. It mostly makes it clear that city council is not the person you appeal to if you yeah. don't like the city manager's yeah. staff decision. Yeah. And we will get that occasionally, you know, a permittee for some kind of administrative permit will say, well, I don't like this and I'm going to appeal and I'm going to go to city council. No, the chart says, and the text that you just read, says no, you're welcome to go to district court, but we're done here at the city level. So. Yeah, and to your point about what would happen in the event the city manager wasn't available, like there was a disaster. We, we put that into, I think, our disaster and emergency plan where we have succession and it lists out the department heads and who would take over after. So that was thought of. Yeah, okay. Uh, I was just curious. I was sitting there thinking, well, gee, what happens? Uh, and, and does it come to the mayor? Does it come to the council? And, and uh, you know, it comes to the city councilor alphabetically by starting at the end of the alphabet. We're going to put your card in thousand blocks. Yeah. You know, so it was just a, a, a question, and I thought, well, for my own clarity, I, I'd like it to, to be answered. I mean, you guys did a great job and good stuff. And, uh, well, thanks, guys. Yeah. No other questions for you? then we appreciate your hard work and we recognize it's a work in progress and it is nice that we're not doing some of these really inflammatory and controversial changes but just 
a lot of housekeeping. Yeah. A lot of cleaning up and yeah. laying uh, a solid yeah. foundation. Yeah. 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 And as a That's former right. builder and developer, uh, this process and the, the charts uh, makes it more simple a lot for easier a to beginner follow, yeah. to, to get involved in, and know exactly where they're going rather than uh, you go here and then they send you over there and then they send you over here and uh, uh, wander least, around the buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And we get multiple calls a day of where do we find this in the code and a lot of times you have to direct people you first look here and then you look here and then you gotta look over here and this will be really from a processing standpoint phenomenal. It's, it, it'll be fantastic for, for all parties. So. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on. And you gentlemen are welcome to stay, but... Oh, <laughs> yeah. no, they have to come with us. We're, <laughs> we're doing phase two. <laughs> Thank you. We'll get them right, set up. Well, well actually, you may want to stay and listen because we've got one more one thing, thing, don't we? And we actually, we'll, we'll jump oh. into this right away and we'll kind of incorporate this into City Council. I about that. Is Senate Bill 23-213, which is going to have the potential to take away a lot of local control and we're gonna, I'm going to throw this to Ben and not let him give us kind of a quick overview of kind of what it, what's dealing with because it also deals with building code and fire code and a lot of these other well CML describes it as the most sweeping attempt in recent Colorado history to remove local control and home rule authority over land use matters um, it's a it's a top-down approach from the state level to zoning and land use standards uh, puts these decisions into um, the state's hands and takes them out of ours um, I had made a, a joke when I first talked about this I think it was with Jace in your office I had said well what's the point of even having cities at all if it's all going to be done by the state um, and I'm told by Ann that that same joke came up in uh, the CML presentation on this. So I think that's a fair way of looking at it. They're really um, preempting us you know, across a wide swath of our land use authority. Um, the concern, of course, is for um, affordable housing. Um, the state apparently feels they can solve that crisis themselves without us. Um, I think CML, as well as I'm going to just assume the city staff would disagree with this. Um, these are probably things that are best handled at a hyper-local level rather than um, the higher state level. CML is making a pretty strong push to try and get municipalities and local officials to speak out. Um, I just got an email during the meeting today, another um, push from them to try and get responses from us. Um, I'd sent you all an email, I'm sure you've seen it, I think Ed clearly had read it, um, trying to get uh, your input on this. There are different things we can do. I think there are four things. There's a group letter that CML could have us add our names to. There is a resolution that we can bring before you. Um, for you all to pass. There is uh, also an opportunity for us to testify in front of um, the uh, state legislature. And um, I think also, of course, you could write letters on your own if you wish. What is your uh, desire? Do you want us to bring you a resolution or take any other action or leave it alone? That's about I would it. love to see us do a resolution opposing this because we feel that it is uh, overreach on an epic level at and the I, state. I, I totally agree with that. I would agree, and even that, I'll throw out the caveat that I normally don't think that um, our council has traditionally taken positions on legislation. Um, we just we have enough to do locally. Um, there are some councils across the, the state that are very active in, in lobbying as councils and talk about both federal and state legislation, and we just don't, and that's great, um, but I think this is kind of an exception because it is so egregious. Uh, I agree with the rest of the council. I think that it's, it's hard enough for builders and developers and uh, building and planning staff to, to work 
with what we have as uh, zoning and, and building regulations without having uh, another complex organization <laughs> dictating uh, what, what we should do at a local level. I also think it's interesting given what we've been doing at a local level has been working towards more housing, more density. Like We've been doing kind of all the things that the state wants to tell us we have to do. Um, we have been increasing density and we have been annexing and we have been zoning. Yeah, we. so it's kind of insulting too in that regard. Yeah, I, we've been working hard to address all these issues proactively Yeah, and to have all of our efforts superseded by a legislator in the front range is kind of offensive. So with that, I think the direction of staff would be to kick ass. <laughs> Whereas names the city that. council is very offended you even brought this up. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> Well I was thinking I'll when just you weigh in and tell me how I concur. <laughs> yes, David concurs. Excellent. I just if you look at if you just look at our council meeting from two weeks ago, we we increased density. We we allowed multifamily where there previously wasn't. We, I, it's just it's frustrating. It'd be, yeah. So, I, I think that if we could get developers to include more of this stuff instead of uh, they ask for a higher zoning and then just make the lot smaller for single family residents, uh, I think that if there was just some uh, way to say, look, you know, it's time that you. Uh, include some of these instead of not in my uh, area. Uh, well, I, I like the fact that we have the ability and the knowledge here locally to be able to make that determination and to have somebody in the front range take that away from us, yes. I think, is an out overreach by the government of the state government. So we want a resolution. We do. We want to send a letter. What do we? What? Are, what are the steps? We are saying yes to all of those ideas. I would like us to do, obviously to do a, a resolution. Um, they have included on the CML site a couple of different options, yes. uh, links that we could do. One link is for individuals to send a letter or basically sign on to an existing letter. And I have already done so. And if the rest of you feel strongly, I would encourage you to look that up. We all received that a, a CML State House report with that emergency action kind of required or requested. So there are a couple of links on there for a couple of different options. So those are great venues for us to pursue. I think it's good too to point out the survey we're doing right now on housing too. Mm -hmm. a piece of that. Mm -hmm. What about testimony? Um, Do you want to test? Um, there is also a link to sign up to testify on that same link. So if you want to be included in the list of people that are testifying, you can sign up at that same on that same email, on that same link. Is this uh, that CML link specific for council members, or could we put it, say, uh, out in public so that the public uh, that has an interest in this uh, might get in, involved by writing letters to the state capital, the governor, whatever, so that uh, we're not trying to do this all by itself and that we could get like public input uh, and support for for our position. The link to sign on to the letter I think is specific because it asks your title and city. Okay. So that mm -hmm. wouldn't really apply to somebody else that wasn't with a city. I think just reaching out to our local news outlets <clears throat> and letting them know that this, this issue exists, I'm not sure where there would be links that the public could but you contact your uh, But they do have links to contact your state representatives would it be appropriate to ask staff to try to testify on behalf of the city of Montrose I mean is that something that we could direct that sure. we would want staff with area expertise and I think I look at either Jace or Ann that we would ask them to see if they can make time to do that on behalf of the city of Montrose and making that clear that you are doing so at the request and behest of the city council can that's not we'll because step rather, in our rather than all line. of us getting on there and talking for three minutes and being ignored. Happy to. We'll get to it. I like that idea as if well. That's okay. Rather, rather it is not us. overstepping yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay. And sign a bill up. 
All right. Well, in the interest of time, I want to kind of wrap that particular item up. Are there any other city council discussions or questions or items that you'd like to bring up? Are there any staff reports or comments that you would like to make? Just a quick Scott? one. Um, next work session, we'll be talking about runoff forecasts and flooding forecasts. Oh, so, excellent. Um, well, it's kind of fresh in everybody's mind right now, so we'll bring some data to start talking about. Perfection. And our city hall is open, new city hall. Um, so we're up and running, and our community can visit us there. And council, I've been sharing information with you as we move along. But if there's anything you're wondering about, about how we're operating, our functions, where things are, please just let me know. And the public is welcome to come in, kind of come into the front door yeah. and look Check around a little bit. Yeah. Um, we also will be moving into our regular council chambers at our next work session. We're going to jinx it. <laughs> I know, I'm afraid to even say it out loud. <laughs> but right. Jim, can I can give us a quick update on how that yeah, project's going? Sure. That, that is still a plan um, for next work session to have in the council chambers. Um, it's coming down to the wire, I think, every, just like every project, but um, the plan is still in place. So. Do we need to bring our work clothes with us, or? Yeah. yeah. We need to put some carpet down on our way in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but I have a paintbrush. I'll just stick in my back pocket yeah, just in knee, case. Knee pads required. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no other staff comments or questions or any other input for the, the good of the city, then we will adjourn our work session. We do have a s executive session for personnel matters immediately following this, but we'll take about a 15 minute break. And we'll say actually at 1245, we will reconvene.